We're continuing with verse 11 of the Mandukya Upanishad. To briefly recap, the Mandukya Upanishad has 12 verses and in this it comments on the three main states of consciousness which are waking, dreaming and deep sleep. It explains what Om is, it's a sound, and it also is a symbol. And finally, it tells us about the fourth. The fourth, which is not really a state, but due to the limitations of words, we sometimes end up calling it a state. However, it is not a state, it is that which is beyond. We are now going to start with the last two verses of this very profound Upanishad. And these are verses 11 and 12. I am reading verse 11. The consciousness experienced during the deep state of sleep is M, the third letter of Om. One who knows this more subtle state as well is able to comprehend all within himself. The one who knows this more subtle state. This state of deep sleep is even subtler than the dream state. In the last verses, we saw how the dream state is finer and subtler than the waking state. This state of deep sleep is even subtler. When we experience this state at night, when we go to bed, you close your eyes and if you're really alert, and you're really aware, you might just catch the first dreams emerging out of the dream state, but you lose consciousness. You go into the dream state, which is then unconscious. You experience a lot of dreams, you're not aware of this. And this is a very fine, subtle state. And then you go deeper into deep sleep, where even the dreams seem to disappear. What happens to these dreams? Where are they? They are back in the seeds. So what is in this deep sleep state? These are the samskaras. And the one who knows this state is able to comprehend all within himself. Now these samskaras are like seeds. They're the seeds of desire. They're the seeds of the impressions. The seeds that push you or propel you outwards into the world to manifest, to allow them to manifest in the world. So these are little seeds. We all know what a seed is, it looks like if you take the seed of a tree and you see the seed, if you cut open some fruit, you know, they're very big seeds. A mango, for example, has a very large seed. Avocados have very, very big seeds inside. So we see the seed and when you look at the seed, you know that this seed has the potential in it of the entire tree from 
the seed of a mango fruit from the seed within can emerge an entire mango tree. It is fascinating but it's true that the entire potential of that tree is in this seed. Would it make sense to say in that case that when you know the seed you know the entire tree. If you understand the potential of within that seed you have understood all the potential. Do you think that's a reasonable statement? That's a question to you. Balaji, what do you think? Is that a reasonable statement to make? She's gone off somewhere, I guess. <laughs> okay, I guess I'm going to just take that as uh, an answer since Balaji's not able to speak. And... Um, So when one knows the seed, one knows the tree. So, following that same logic, the seeds that are in the deep sleep are the seeds that make you the person you are. So if you open an apples, apple, cut open an apple, you see many little seeds inside, right? Deep in the core. So... Your core is the deep sleep state. And there are many seeds in it, just like inside an apple, there are many seeds. And out of these seeds emerge dreams, desires, fears, things you want to do, expectations, emotions, all these seeds are within you. And that's what creates the person. That's who you are at that level of a seed. During the process of deep meditation, in dhyana, deep meditation, as well as the process of contemplation, these seeds emerge forward. These samskaras emerge forward. The hidden is invited forward and when the hidden comes forward you see it. And when you see it, you know it. And when you know it, it loses power over you. And this Seeing in inverted commas, since you can't see me making these two little inverted commas with my fingers, these are, is an act of burning the samskaras. Traditionally, an example is used. The example is of a person who sees a snake in the dark. You see a snake and you get afraid and you say, oh my God, uh, there's a snake there. And you see some wriggly little thing, something lying there. And you're terrified because in the dark you can't see so clearly. And you're actually just projecting your fears outward 
and you see something in the dark and you assume it's a snake. But when you switch on your torch, your flashlight, and you look at it, and you suddenly discover, oh, it's not a snake. It's just a rope. This is the example given traditionally. When these seeds come forward, these samskaras come forward, and you see them in the light of consciousness, they are no longer so frightening and terrible. They just are, just like a rope is. They just are. They, they have no more power over you. They cannot scare you. You know, they, they, they have absolutely no more handle over you. So by knowing the seed, you begin to know your deepest self. Your you begin to start knowing your nature. It's not your deepest self, but you begin to know your nature. It's like a pot. If you know how to work with clay, and you can make different kinds of pots out of it, you see a different pot, you see a pot in the shape of a glass, you see pots in shape of uh, jugs, you, you can turn the clay into a doll, you can turn it into um, some sort of toys, or even plates and uh, other decorative items. But all of these are made of clay. Would it be reasonable to say that if you know clay, the raw, the raw substance, clay, and you know how to form that clay into different things, then you know all of that. You know all the different forms. In a sense, they are all clay. One takes the form of a doll, and one may take the form of a, a jug, another in the form of a pot, but they all are clay. So also, when the samskaras rise, you look at them in the light of consciousness, then you see that they have no power over you after all. All along, they were... They were they were just seeds. Just as when you look at the mango seed or the apple seed, it's just a seed. It's not terribly frightening or bad. It's just a seed. So it has the potential, there's the energy. And looking at them in the light of consciousness, the power it has over you is gone. This seed is now like a roasted seed. What happens when you take a seed and roast it? The energy potential in it dies. It no longer has the power to germinate. So the seed itself may remain but the seed has no longer got any power. It's a roasted seed, it will never germinate. Let's take a concrete example. Take the example of anger. You may be angry about certain things. Some people are angry about the injustice in the world. Some people are angry about poverty. Now these are big issues and in a sense they're superficial because almost everybody feels upset about inequalities, injustice, you know, these kind of things. But at a deeper level, maybe you're angry at, about individual things. Maybe you get angry when somebody is rude to you. Well, you may get angry when somebody is disrespectful. 
You may get angry when somebody cheats you out of your, your rights, your personal rights. You may get angry because somebody is harming uh, somebody you love who is close to you. You may get angry when somebody takes away something that belongs to you. So this anger is deeper and it is it's much more personal. So far, the anger we are talking about is anger related to something. There's always an object. It's an anger about something. It's an anger about injustice. Anger about somebody being rude to you. When you start the meditation process, at the superficial level, you may, you may see that you get angry when somebody is disrespectful towards you or rude to you. And just being aware of that, you may realize that perhaps the anger is not about the person being rude to you, but in fact, the anger is about you not feeling good about yourself. In fact, the seed is a kind of a, a message that you have stored in there which says, I'm not really worthy of respect. And you have stored that in you. And when you see that, suddenly you become aware and conscious and say, oh, okay, I'm a good person, I'm worthy of respect. Irrespective of others respect me or not, I know I am a good and valuable person who contributes to society. So that is how you would deal with anger at the level of waking and dream state. It's related to something. But anger, the seed, anger itself, is not anger about this or that. It is pure anger. It is the seed itself. Now imagine the entire samskara of anger would come forward. And you see just pure the seed itself, anger. And you say, oh my God, I, I wasn't aware that I had so much anger in me. And when the anger comes forward and you look at it and it's now gone, it's a roasted seed, what does that mean? It means that now you no longer feel anger about this and that and the other. All those different things that you felt angry about. You don't feel angry about all those different things. In the same way you did before. The quality is different. You're not so caught up in that anger anymore. You might even find yourself playing, role playing. And you might just see yourself going through the motions of being angry about something but it doesn't really touch you. And so what you have done is that the very seed, the samskara itself, the samskara of anger itself has at the deepest level lost its handle, has lost its power over you. So you can imagine how much deeper this is. At this level, you're not dealing with the objects of being angry with all the different things in the world, which is an amazing amount of things, if you think about it. But you're going to the root cause itself and working with pure anger in its raw form. And that means you have accelerated the entire process of purification.
What this essentially means is that the deep sleep state, which is a tamasic state, is a state of absolute unconsciousness, there's no sense of awareness there, has now become more conscious and it's beginning to surface, it comes up, it begins to surface. Some of you are, may have heard of the practice of Yoga Nidra. Now Yoga Nidra is a, a practice which takes us down into the state of deep sleep. Most um, people are following practices from internet or books or CDs um, and these yoga, there are many yoga nidra practices and some of them are extremely complicated. When I'm talking about yoga nidra, I don't mean these techniques of yoga nidra. I don't mean complicated techniques. I mean the state of yoga nidra. There is a difference between the techniques and the state. The techniques or practice of Yoga Nidra is meant to lead you to the state of Yoga Nidra. I can assure you that all those complicated techniques that you get with visualization and all these things are highly unlikely to lead you to the state of Yoga Nidra. And if you would experience the state of Yoga Nidra, it means you go down into the state of deep sleep and you are fully aware there. You remain aware. And when you are able to do that, that means you see who you are. In dhyana, in the process of dhyana and samadhi, which leads to samadhi, we seek to bring that state of deep sleep, which is where the samskaras are stored, to bring the entire state up into our waking awareness. Now this is a highly advanced state of meditation and leads into samadhi. So we say that actually samadhi is a transitory state between deep sleep and turiya, which is the fourth. So we are quite deep in this. We have already reached samadhi and turiya. And... I don't expect that everybody understands everything that we are talking about. It's okay if you don't understand certain things. It's just sometimes good to let them sink in. You can contemplate over these thoughts and... Maybe sometime in the future you will be able to validate these teachings yourself through direct experience. I hope. Okay, good. So, anybody wants to um, ask anything? that is related to verse 11, to deep sleep, to yoga nidra, to the transition. to ask why is it actually that the letters are connected um, to a certain state um, 
it could also be that A is deep sleep and M is waking state. Why, why is it specifically this way? The main thing is the internal sound, anahat nada. That's the most important thing. Uh, anahat nada sounds like, like a deep vibration. In deep meditation, when you start going beyond the state of deep sleep and towards Turiya, to the deep silence within, it's such a powerful vibration that if you would experience it the first time, it can be very scary, almost scary. That's one of the reasons why in some traditions throughout the world, one says there's this, you know, almost fearful aspect of the divine. It's like thunder. It's very, very powerful. So the important thing is the sound, the anahata nada, nada itself. And it sounds like a deep, very deep humming. And it's just, just flowing. It's, it's the vibration of the universe. It's this resonance. It's this deep, deep uh, vibration. And these letters, A, U, and M, these are merely a convention and they have been sort of fitted into the three states. It doesn't have really any meaning. It's just a convention and it sounds, it's, it's a word which sounds quite close to this original sound, this, this anahat nada this unstruck sound. So it could have been something else. It could have been, instead of Om, A-U-M, it could have been Mum, M-U-M. <laughs> and guess what? In fact, that's where the word mother comes from. In Ma is very similar to Om or Amma, which is also used in India. It's very similar to the, sa the same sound. And that is also the first sort of sound that a child makes, ma 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 ma, you know, mama. And as I said, it could have also been mum. It could have been something else. It doesn't really matter as long as the last letter would have been M, because that's the sound of the humming. It could have been hum instead of om. Could have been hum, just like so hum ends with a hum at the end. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. So it's just a convention, and um, as you can see in English, it was also written as O M O. Um, it um, doesn't really matter. The Devanagari script, of course, puts it very beautifully as uh, O and Ma and the entire vowels uh, have been created uh, keeping the science of mantra or uh, mantra vidya in mind. It's the science of sound. So the entire Devanagari that you know very well, Joachim, you know the Devanagari, you, you know uh, how, how it's written. So... You know the vowels, how they are forming, how the letters form, and all these are the basic sounds that we use in a language. So it's a science of sound. And so they chose these because it seemed the most appropriate letters to represent the three states of consciousness, leading finally to silence. As I said, it could have also been mum, could have also been hum. It could have also been something else. Okay. Yeah, it it's clear that uh, the um, they are just following the natural 
appearance of this and not the other way around. No? It's, yes. Because it's, um, yeah. it can be any script, right? It could have also invented by the Chinese. This, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, to follow this inside, yes. maybe they have. Yeah, yeah, but, but the original. The origin is always the same. It just takes different forms. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, for example, in uh, the Muslims say Amin, and mm -hmm. in Christianity one says Amen. So it's just a similar sound. It Amen, of course, sounds it ends with a Amen with an N, but it is meant to to represent the same sound. Yeah. And this is seen throughout the world. Those who are, you know, are observant and they will see it in many, many primitive traditions. Or, sorry, primitive is the wrong word. In many, uh, many uh, ancient traditions, in tribes, in tribal cultures, in all over the world, in all the religions, you will experience the same sound, only just sometimes uh, the symbol is different, sometimes the sound is represented in a different way, but they all have it. Okay, thank you. Okay, and with that we come to the very last verse. Verse 12, that aspect of consciousness that is not known is the soundless aspect of Om, which is not comprehended by the ordinary mind and senses. It is the state of cessation of all phenomena, even of bliss. This is a non-dual state, one without second, Advaita. This is termed as the fourth state and also as the real self. One who knows this expands himself to universal consciousness. Right in the first lecture, we talked about the fact that the Mundak Upanishad uh, sorry, excuse me, the Mandukya Upanishad is coming from the word frog, mendak. And I explained that the frog goes through a process of metamorphosis, is a symbol of an ideal student, the Abhikari, who goes through a very intense process of practice, purification, to metamorphosize into something else, become something divine, is reborn, a new birth takes place. This new birth, what, what, what are you being born as? What, what is it that happens? This person becomes a witness, is no longer bound to the three states of consciousness. This witness is no longer in that pond of the three states, you know, that muddy, murky pond. The frog is sitting outside witnessing. He is watching. He is untouched. He is just watching all the time, watching, doing nothing. Does that mean that that person, if you would see this person, does that mean this person is not doing anything? No. The person may be actively doing things, participating in life, but the witness within remains untouched and is watching, watching, watching all the time and remains untouched. You can imagine that it's a bit like watching 
a drama, or going to the movies, watching a movie. And there may be terrible things happening there. You know, if it's a violent movie, some awful things happening, or in a, in a theater, there's a drama, there's, there's also a lot of emotional stuff happening. But you know that it's not happening to you. It's happening there on the stage or on, on, the, on the screen. And you're just watching. And so, all of life becomes a theater or a stage. And the witness is watching. So it seems that to the person who is witnessing that, I, that there is neither, it's not even a state of bliss anymore. It's even beyond that. A state of bliss is experienced in deep sleep when you go to deep sleep with your awareness, when you're conscious. But now, as a witness, you're not even experiencing bliss because you do not experience, you're just watching. You're an observer, you're a witness. And all the things in the world are just happening. And it's beautiful. You see it like a play or a theater or a drama. And it's gorgeous. See it as Leela, the divine play. It's a play of consciousness. The aspect of the frog comes in here again. In English, we use the term leapfrog sometimes. And it means when you jump over something. And in the sense, this fourth Turiya is not even a state. You have jumped beyond all these three and gone to the highest where you can see everything from your high summit. You can see everything. You know everything. It is nothing like any of the three states of waking, dreaming and deep sleep. Which is why it cannot really be described. It is not comprehended by the mind because it cannot be known by the senses. Our normal mind knows waking and dreaming states through the senses, essentially. In deep sleep, even the senses drop away, and that's why most of us have a hard time understanding how is it possible to be aware in deep sleep. And now you're saying that this goes even beyond and in effect is nothing, not even a sense of bliss. This leads many people to the misunderstanding that secession of all phenomena means it's a blank state. There's nothing there, blank. Or that the person dies. It is not death. It's not physical death. It's not a blank state where the mind just switches off. Well, that would be like falling into, you know, becoming unconscious. It's not like that. In fact, it's a state of pure consciousness. You're fully conscious. And you're always witnessing. Such a one is not dead, in fact. He is only the only one who is really and truly alive. When you are established as a witness, then you realize that you are now finally born. Before that, you were dead. And that is why traditions throughout the world for millennia have given those who have attained 
a state of witness. Such a cherished and position of, of great respect. It is also called Sakshi Bhav. Sakshi is the witness, that mood, that, that, that state where you are witness. We always struggle with the words. No? As I said, it's not a state. It's not even really a bhava. It's not a mood either. But you become Sakshi. You are Sakshi. You are a witness. Such a person is also a Jeevan Mukt. Jeevan Mukt means the one who is liberated in the body. Which means that those samskaras that we talked about in the state of deep sleep no longer have any real power over you. And in order to to accelerate the process of um, of burning up the samskaras, such a jivan mukt may start manifesting the samskaras. And as he manifests the samskaras, all the same, his actions do not create more samskaras. He is free. He is free from the bondage of karma. Vichara, Atma Vichara, is that beautiful dialogue which leads us to the, uh, to, to the answer to, to the original question, which is, who am I? In Turiya, in the fourth, we get the answer to that. such a person is then always in this state of vichara where he is contemplating and he is having a beautiful dialogue, a conversation with all things around him. It's a state of communion. He's united with everything. There's a sense of expansion where we bear the person really validates the Mahavakya, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman, I am the universe. There's a sense of expansion. It's not a contraction. Some people think this is all about contracting and leaving the world, escaping. But in fact, the end of the journey is coming back to where you are. It's a kind of a circle. You come back exactly to where you are. You don't go anywhere. You're here, right here. And only difference is you have expanded completely. Your consciousness expands to include everything and everybody. And you're in a state of constant communion with everything around you. This is Advaita. This is that state of being one without the second. There is no sense of separation anymore. Because you are the universe. When we speak of such things, you know, state of Advaita, being witness, it's become a fashion for some people to talk about these things. We call them neo advaitites They talk about these things without having any experience of it. And they keep debating and arguing. And that's not very useful. Those who will study books intellectually will 
get into arguments. We do not learn from books really. We need to learn by doing our practice, by getting to know ourselves. When you get to know yourself, you will find that you are actually validating the scriptures. And that's how it should be, not the other way around. You don't learn something from a book and try to practice it. Rather, you practice something that you may have learned from your teacher or if you are one of those rare ones, then it's all coming forward from, from within because you have done it before and it just happens to you. And then you validate it. You validate the scriptures. So, all that we have discussed on consciousness, all the states of consciousness, I hope that this does not remain an intellectual discussion and that this will inspire you to continue practice, to seek out a teacher if you don't have one, to get a systematic approach to your practice, learn a practice or systematic approach as well as integrate this in your daily life. So that it doesn't just remain something that's really dead, you know, books are dead, just dead matter. You want to make this something that is living, breathing life into you and, 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 and um, transforming your entire life. And that is only possible when the practice comes first, when the guidance from an unbroken lineage is put uh, is given more importance than intellectual discussions and books and study. So any questions about verse 12 or in general about this Upanishad, about the states of consciousness? We can also have questions related to to personal experience or practice uh, with reference to this. If you... Okay, it seems that um, there are no questions. In that case, we have come to the end of the Mandukya Upanishad. This is our, was our last session before we take a break for three weeks. We will restart on the 16th of June with uh, the Mundak Upanishad. The Mundak Upanishad is larger. I think it's around 64 verses. And it's really very beautiful. And uh, also dealing with similar subject matter, internal practice. And um, symbolism of um, of the Samaya uh, tradition. So it's uh, 
an Upanishad that this was normally taught only to renunciates and it is available to householders if they meditate then it makes sense if they don't meditate then it will remain just a very theoretical or intellectual approach just as with the Upanishad it's very similar uh, only it goes into further detail. Okay, in that case, since there are no more questions or comments, we can stop. And we see you in three weeks' time on 16th of June when we start with the Mullah Upanishad. Okay. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Bye. Bye.